most important thing in the Girls' Lounge is visibility. If you can't see it, you can't be it. And if you can't share it, shame on you. And so here we go. We're going to do another Unplugged um, because we met this fabulous new women, woman that we, we need to, to, to talk about. Um, so Amy, and we're going to have Laura from Cosmo um, have a nice little Hi. chat with you Great. about the successful ingredients of entrepreneurs. And so knock yourselves out and have fun Great. over there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is like the last panel before the wrap-up, which is a very exciting thing. Thank you all so much for being here all weekend. Let's, can we give Shelly one more round of applause? Yeah. Before we get yeah. this going. completely rallied around to say let's just take that that scary step together which makes it more fun and then I called the girlfriends from the girls and said can you all come with us and the answer was yes and then we figured out how but it was not even a hesitation or a hiccup it was yes and here we are together and when we talk about confidence confidence is beautiful for me confidence is having the most incredible team that always comes together. There is no leader. We all go as a posse, and it really is a collaboration. And I, I can't thank you all enough, and Laura, that just decided to grab the mic. Uh, one of our uh, hey, Laura. posse. <laughs> Yay, bravo, everybody. bravo. All right, so Amy Wilkinson um, is a professor at Stanford Business School. Before that she has her she also went to went to Harvard Business School and has her masters in sociology and I already got shit wrong <laughs> she's looking at me like no I was a senior fellow at Harvard for five years um, doing the research for this book called the creator's code and that um, I interviewed 200 of the top entrepreneurs in the United States to figure out what skills they had in common you had to start a company and scale it over hundred million in annual revenue in five to ten years, so it's the biggest data set right now of high-scale entrepreneurs in the U.S. And it's and we we can talk about the code so that more women can do this. What percentage of the people that you spoke to were women? Um, so you know, roughly thirty percent of the the entrepreneurs in this data set are women. That's good. Um, it's pretty good. A uh, higher percent are featured in the book because I want to give examples uh, of women who succeeded. So Spanx, the founder of Spanx, Sarah Blakely's in the book. Um, the founder of Stella and Dot, one of the two founders, Jessica Heron is in the book. The founder of Zipcar, Robin Chase, um, is in the book. The two founders of Revolution Foods, which is a fabulous startup out of the East Bay of San Francisco, they're in the book. And it's important to me to um, show more, more examples. I love that you're doing that, that you're kind of, I think one of the things is these women need to be celebrated and discussed in the same breath with other unicorn entrepreneurs. Oh, completely. Shoulder to shoulder. I think that women um, are equals and, you know, not more, not less, just absolutely in the marketplace creating and scaling companies. All right, so obviously we want to know what the six essential skills are. Like, let's get right to that. Okay, so skill one is called find the gap. It's how do you spot an opportunity that other people don't see. Um, there are three ways. I, I'm calling them as a sunbird, architect, and integrator. So a sunbird, just like a bird would, picks up an idea in one place, flies it over to another place, reapplies it. Um, this is the Starbucks founder, Howard Schultz. He doesn't invent coffee culture. He sees it in Italy. He picks it up, flies it back into Seattle, does a little twist on it, and voila, it's a massive international company. Okay. Um, another way to find a gap is as an architect would. So Sarah Blakely, we can use her as an architect. She solves her own problem, which is she wants a body smoothing um, thing to wear under white pants. She's a door-to-door -door fax machine salesman in Atlanta. Um, and is cutting the feet out of her nylons. The nylons are rolling up her legs. She's wearing these, you know, kind of uncomfortable nylons under pants. She starts her own um, lingerie, basically, an undergarment company, and becomes the youngest self-made female billionaire in 2012. That company is started with $5,000, and it is wholly owned by Sarah. So, I mean, it's a phenomenal example. I, I think she is one of the only women who signed the Warren Buffett. Yes, she's pledge. the youngest. The youngest, youngest yes. Uh huh. Um, and she's pledging money for women and girls. That's yeah. right. So, 
just a side note. So, yeah, yeah. And then the third way to find a gap, just to finish, is as, is as an integrator. So people, can, you can integrate, mash and smash things together that haven't been put together before, and Chipotle would be an example. So Steve Ells, the founder of Chipotle, is a classically trained chef, um, but he went into the fast food industry, basically, and created Fast Casual as a new kind of restaurant. So that would be skill one. Poor Chipotle. Go on. All okay. Right. <laughs> do, you, do you want the other? Yeah. Right, we'll go real quick. Okay. So skill two is called Drive for Daylight. How do you manage speed like a race car driver? So you wait, first you need the idea. Then two. You need the idea. So two is you need to manage speed. So you need to drive for the light on the horizon. You need to drive for daylight. It takes a lot of focus. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs were using this analogy of, hey, I feel like a race car dri driver. So I actually enrolled in NASA driving school, Get tested out. the analogy, drove Road Atlanta. Um, and it's really true. You always look forward. You are not looking in a rearview mirror. You're not looking at the competitors next to you. You are not looking at the lines um, on the pavement or the rules of the game. You are driving right towards where you want to go. Um, and so that is the second skill. That is fascinating. I have never heard that before. That that you're not when you're in a race car, you're not. You can't be looking, you know, anywhere other than where you want to go. That's okay. That's fascinating. So that's skill two. Um, skill three. Yes. Skill three. Oh, so you have the idea. You have the you're idea. Managing you manage how you're the speed. There. That's no, right. right. Now number number three. three is called fly the OODA loop, and this stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. Observe, orient, decide, and act. Okay. That's right. Walk us so that. it's originally a fighter pilot mantra. If you want to win a dogfight, um, you have to outmaneuver a competitor. So the way you do that is you make fast decisions. You have to observe what's going on, orient very quickly to it, decide, take action. And this is the idea that, you know, it's not to be or not to be, oh, I don't know what to do. You just... Take a decision, it changes the, the landscape, and it actually changes the dynamic of a fight. Um, so a competitor is responding to something that's changed. Uh -huh. If you can get a tighter loop, if you can be inside the loop of a competitor, you learn faster. What um, explain what that means. So I'll use an example. Yeah. So PayPal is a great example of this. Uh -huh. um, they iterated, basically, they changed their business model six times in 18 months. They sold to eBay when the tech bubble burst in 2002 for $1.5 billion. Everyone else closed up. Um, people were crying in Silicon Valley that technology was over. It was doom and gloom. And now the people in that original team went on to start um, YouTube, LinkedIn, Yelp, Slide, Tesla Motors, SpaceX. They Slackers. put the first money behind Facebook, Yammer. Um, Palantir, which is here, it's an, an extraordinary story. And when you spend time with that team and you say, how is this possible? Um, y the Yelp founder, Jeremy Stoppelman, for example, was an intern at PayPal. And what he'll say is, I learned to observe really carefully what was going on and look for a counterintuitive blip of data. That's a direct okay. quote in the book. Look for something that surprises you. What's counterintuitive? What do you not expect? Orient to it, decide, act, build a business around it. So what did he discover like that that made him think of Yelp? So Yelp was an email referral system at the beginning. It was not a review site. They had a tiny little feature that was embedded in this email referral system that said, do you want to write a review? And, and Jeremy did not think anyone would want to write a review. Mm -hmm. He did not think it would be fun to review a local nail salon or a restaurant or a dry cleaner or whatever. He just didn't think people cared. Now, the counterintuitive blip of data is that that started getting a lot of traction. Oh. And so they very quickly moved and built a company that's a review site company. That's what Yelp is. Yes. It is not how it started. Wow, OK. Um, can you give an example of the act part of it. I think a lot of people can like see the problem, but then the like leaping and acting is so hard. Like, is there someone who would like have who a does that? Yeah. So I would. Uh, Elon Musk is a fabulous example of this, right? So the founder of Tesla and SpaceX and PayPal. He's a co-founder. Um, he's also at Solar City. He's building the Hyperloop. He continues to act, um, and in every way, he believes that the more you act, the more decisions that you take quickly, the more information you gain to make you more successful. 
So use SpaceX as an example. He wants to build a reusable rocket. They have launched multiple rockets that have not been able to land, right? And um, I've talked to him a few different times, interviewed him for this book multiple times, and he kept saying to me, every time we fail, I learn something. I take an action, and, and that's at big scale, yeah. right? And very public, um, that those actions are more and more and more informative. And he learns, and now, as of December, they have landed a reusable rocket. Um, he also is resupplying the International Space Station. <laughs> He's taking over NASA's contracts, and he does it at one-tenth the price that the U.S. government did. It's extraordinary. But this is an ability to take action, even um, despite the odds. When everybody else says, oh, it's impossible, you won't do it, you're failing, these rockets are crashing, um, you just keep taking actions in order to learn. Is that a muscle you can build, the ability to do that? Yeah. So I think all of these skills are learnable, teachable. Um, it doesn't take perfect timing or a, a million dollars or a certain credential. It's all very accessible. Okay. All right, so that was, we're on three. We just did three. We did we, three. We came up with the idea. We determined our focus and right. where we were going with it. And then decision making, changing the game. That's now. right. And then um, skill four is called fail wisely. Because there's no doubt that um, creating companies is not a straight line. Um, there are big obstacles, things go wrong. Um, the idea is that you want to be smart about failures. You want to fail wisely. And this concept is um, people set a failure ratio. And they basically say, I'm going to get it wrong one in three times. And that's my ratio, and that's what I want. Um, or I'll get it wrong 10% of the time. So um, you know, one in 10 things I try is not going to work. You don't want a zero ratio. That would be perfection. You don't want that. Because what that means is you're leaving on the table um, things you can be completely blindsided. So an example is Stellan Dot, a fabulous founder, Jessica Heron, and she basically does say one in three things that she tries is not going to work, and she runs a jewelry company. So they are having all of the women, the stylists, post love it or lose it on their styles. I love it or just lose it, lose it quick um, from the you know next lineup of what they're they're selling. Wow. Okay. And then the last one. Oh, the fifth one, so six, we have sorry, six, six, so we're on five. Okay, um, we're on five. Five is called Network Minds, and this idea is about um, cognitive diversity. So people can look the same and think very differently. We talk about diversity now, what we look like mm -hmm. on the outside. This is about diversity of your brain. So you could be trained as an anthropologist or a computer scientist. You could be an extrovert or an introvert. Your brain can be very different regardless of how you look. Um, and so if you can harness that cognitive diversity, you can solve problems we haven't solved in the past. So that's about what Shelley was just talking about, like bringing people together. Bringing people together and um, building on each other's ideas. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have people that think differently and bring different skills to the table, you're going to be missing out. Oh, completely. You won't, you won't solve things um, that we haven't solved. So I can give a quick example. The head of um, the GE medical team is a man named Doug Dietz. And I love this example because um, he designed the MRI machine. And I don't know how many people have had MRIs here, but it's, you know, scary and loud and claustrophobic and cold and all of these things. For children, it's particularly um, terrifying, right? So uh, Doug Dietz was in a hospital and a seven-year-old little girl came to be mm -hmm. scanned, and she was holding the hands of her parents. And the second she saw this machine, she just melted down, right? Started crying. It was it, it's bad for her and her parents and the lab techs. They didn't get the scan done. Ninety percent of kids have to be sedated to do an MRI. Wow. Um, so he felt like a big failure as a designer of this technology. Um, he went away and he networked minds. So he got a lot of kids together and daycare providers, and nurses and doctors, and GE medical team, um, designers of children's art museum exhibits, like big art exhibits that kids would interact with. Smart. Yeah, completely different brain power. Mm -hmm. And they redesigned the GE MRI um, machine to be an adventure series for kids. So now when kids go to get a scan, um, they're told a narrative, they meet a camp counselor instead of a nurse, they believe they're going on a jungle safari and these machines are dressed up. Um, they have colorful, 
you know, things and music playing and decals and they have a whole narrative or they think they're going on a pirate adventure. So when it's loud, that's the pirates and or they think they're going on a space odyssey adventure. Um, it's the exact same technology and the sedation rate's basically down to zero. Wow. That's so, incredible stuff. Yeah, it's great. So it's it's a the Did everyone this would, know about this? Am I the only one that never knew about this? They do this now with kids? Yeah. There's That's seven incredible. different adventures that um, kids go on if they need to take an MRI. It's the exact same technology, lower cost, lower medical risk, and better for the most vulnerable patients, being kids. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. Um, so you have to look place. You have to look at unexpected places, it seems, for these Yeah, ideas. or bring unexpected people together. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Very cool. And then the last. Uh-huh. You want the last skill? I want the last skill, and then we'll synthesize <laughs> it all. Okay. Um, the last skill, I find that kind of the most surprising in many ways, um, and it's called gift small goods. And a small good would be a small kindness or a small favor. Um, gifting them would be um, helping somebody, helping a colleague, helping someone in your workplace or your larger environment. Um, the counterintuitive thing here is that when you do that, it actually makes you more effective. It makes you more efficient. Um, it makes you professionally advance. So we used to always say, nice guys finish first. Um, and I wrote a piece recently for Fortune, uh, or nice guys finish last. So I wrote the piece saying nice guys finish first because the research is showing that with technology, our reputations are completely transparent. Right? I know if you're helping people. I can check that on LinkedIn. I can check it on social media, you know, all the way across. I can find somebody who's worked with you. I can ask them. Mm -hmm. It used to be a boss that could reference check an incoming employee, but in you know, lower people on the totem pole just didn't know much information. Now we can all find out information. So what that means is um, people who are gifting small goods are people you want to work with. Information goes to them, talent goes to them, deal flow goes to them. Their careers are advanced because people want to work with them. Um, the flip side is also true. If you cheat someone, we're, we're gonna know that now. We're gonna find out. And this is new in the last five years. I mean, this is new with the speed of information and the transparency of our reputations. Um, so it puts pressure on better behavior, which I think is wonderful. It's this counterintuitive outgrowth of technology. Can you give an example of somebody who kind of did these small good gave these small gifts and it paid off for them? Yes, so it is the basis of LinkedIn. So Reid Hoffman believes that if you build an economic grid where we all can be linked to each other, um, that the simple thing of forwarding a resume um, unlocks a lot of benefit. And in Silicon Valley, where I live, everyone wants to work with Reid Hoffman. Um, so he always does this, right? He is always looking for ways to be helpful. Even if he doesn't fund your company, he'll give you an hour of time and some advice. Wow. Um, Another great example is a man named Bob Langer. And I don't know, has anyone here heard of Bob Langer? Um, he runs, I love, I love Bob Langer. Um, he runs the largest bioengineering lab in the world. Um, it's at MIT. He has scaled more than 25 companies, over 100 million in revenue. He's won all the Academy of Sciences Whoa. awards Whoa. in the he Academy of Engineering, 25, 25 companies, companies as a co-founder. Um, okay. Uh, President Obama gave him the highest civilian medal of honor. Uh, most people don't know about him. And the cool part is he does this all by gifting small goods and helping students and postdocs and venture capitalists and doctors and everything else um, in order to solve problems, in his case, to solve human health or stop human suffering. So he himself is not all that well known. The influence of his work is extraordinary. And he does it because he's always gifting small goods and everyone wants to work with him, be in his lab, fund his ideas. It's just, it's an extraordinary example. So these six steps, I was trying to make them linear and they're not linear. No, they're circular. They're so circular. There's, a, there's a diagram in Sorry. here that, you know, it's a code and it's circular. circular. Yeah. I, it's just interesting to me to put the word circular because also the whole sales funnel has gone from being like a, a funnel to a fish kind of funnel, like a fish, it's all circular, mm -hmm. and the digital world affected that, where we no longer live in a linear world, but we live in a multimedia world on steroids, and you can have this kind of mm -hmm. concurrent, you know, goodness happening. I think that's right. I think that um, we're at this 
big change moment in the way the world works. And we've educated people, to your point, in a very linear way. So we've educated people um, through grade school and high school and college, and we've told them um, there is one right answer. You could be a four-point student. You could have a perfect SAT score. Um, you could succeed by yourself, like doing work by yourself. Um, the entire world has changed, um, I think largely technology-driven, where you have to collaborate now. It's all very circular. It's not linear. There's not a right answer. Um, if there was a right answer, we probably would have discovered it. Uh, by now. And so I think, um, you know, I'm getting asked quite a lot, uh, how do you help improve the education system to prepare people for a more entrepreneurial economy? Um, and what do you say? Uh, one of the things is that right now we don't teach kids how to collaborate. No. So if you collaborate in school, uh, we call that cheating, <laughs> right? <laughs> And Which is not well rewarded. No, know. no, it doesn't. It's not. It's not all that helpful, <laughs> no. right? Um, and so I think we have to design education to be more experiential. We have to um, put people in teams. We have to reward teams that work. Um, we have to look at the circular nature of how ideas start and scale and fail and then come back around. And um, the idea that there there is not a linear pathway now. You know, our greatest characteristic as women is to, to share and collaborate, and yet in school we're taught to be competitive, and, you know, just like you said. And so when you think about that generation that rose to the ranks as female leaders today, they're competitive. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have this problem at the top. There's only one job, so we're all competing to get it. Mm -hmm. And so I just was giving a whole, you know, lecture, and I never lecture, an interactive session. I was actually sitting on the floor with... 30 kids at four, you know, four of 30 under 30, and, and I told them that we need to unlearn what they learned in school. I said, you've learned in school to be competitive. Today, your first day of training starts. Unlearn that and learn to collaborate, and you will see the magic that happens when you work together and the power of that. Mm -hmm. And so we have to start, you know, reading that <laughs> course in the school system. But as we have our young people coming into companies, let's start educating them that what they learn in school you know, in the textbook they can throw out now <laughs> and start undoing some of those things. I think that's right. So I am now teaching at Stanford Business School, and this is one of the things I love about Stanford. I think it's a West Coast attitude. I think um, I think it's a Stanford attitude, which is people win together. Yeah. Um, I'm a first-time writer of a book, and so it's been very hard to get down. It's the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. And I'll say my Stanford, I was a Stanford MBA, my classmates, are championing it left and right, and they're so proud of it, and it, it's so nice. it's really nice. It really and it really helps because I have now stepped outside of a business career, and my um, colleagues from that point in time, they couldn't be opening more doors. They couldn't be trying um, harder to be helpful, and I think it's it's an interesting thing for me to see in my own experience. I, mean, I want to know, know more about your process. I want to know more about how the kind of bravery and awesomeness on your part that you got all these people on the phone. Okay. Like, let's talk about your process. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the things that can be hard for anybody when they're starting something new is picking up the phone. Like, how do I connect with that person? How did you do this? Um, so it took five years, right? I chased them down. Good girl. I actually went to them. So these are not phone calls. These are me showing up. Um, no, not unannounced. Like outside their house, like in the no. middle of the night? <laughs> no, I was thing? not. Like, uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I was not stalking people. Good. Um, but it was all kind of through one degree or two degrees of separation. So I would figure out who I wanted to be trying to interview or trying to talk to. Um, these are entrepreneurs of scale. They are very busy people. Uh, and then through a friend of a friend or someone I had worked with or someone I had been in school with, um, everyone was willing to try to forward on and ask. Mm -hmm that said, would you please be featured in an entrepreneurship book? Would you be willing to talk? And the great thing about entrepreneurs that have been very successful, they almost always say yes, because they want other people to succeed. That's great. Um, but you have to go to them. It's on their time. They're busy. I mean, it's, it's a yeah. lot of chasing around. It was very difficult to, um, to do, but I'm very proud of having done it. I, I think it's that. hopefully a valuable contribution. And one of the things, we talked about this in another session, but... Um, the power of asking someone to help you is it's hard to do. It's hard, but it is so powerful when you can do it. And you figured that out. Did, was that a muscle? Did you get better at that? 
I think so. I um, I still struggle with that to some degree. I asked people to help. Uh, I think of it as my own public service, this book. I had been in the White House before. I was a White House fellow, and I did four years of trade and economics. I rolled out of the White House in the too-big-to-fail era um, when we were bailing out banks and auto companies, and I really believed that entrepreneurs were the future. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't feel like I was asking for myself. Yeah. I felt like I was asking to try to do a project that would almost be a public service project. I'd spend my time doing it to try to launch and raise up other people to be entrepreneurs. So that was an easier ask. I mean, to the question, it's a lot easier to say, hey, I want to highlight your story so that more people can be like you. Um, yeah. What about, um, this is, you might be like, yeah, I didn't study that, I don't know. Um, being entrepreneurial within an organization. Yeah, so th I didn't study that. This data set is, is founders mm -hmm. of companies. Um, one of the surprises to me is there's a lot of corporate interest now mm -hmm. in the six skills. Because yeah. people who e exist inside of bigger structures, they want to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. They want to be creative. They want to find a gap and drive for daylight and fly an OODA loop and fail wisely. Um, you know, all of the skills apply. And so that is a somewhat surprising outcome to me of having done this research. It shouldn't be because I think it's a natural human characteristic. We want to be, you know, able to control our own destiny or build things, build and create. So there's a lot of corporate interest now in the six skills. That's fantastic. Um, what did you, were there any differences in kind of what you were getting from the women you spoke to who fell in this group as opposed to the men? Like, were they like, and it was harder for me? Like, what, what was the difference in their experience? So I would say that it's a universal skill set. I think that the women who show up at $100 million in annual revenue for a company they have started, um, they have the same skills as the men do. Okay. Now, that being said, we need more women in that category. Yes. A lot more women. And this is one of the things I'm personally interested in trying to help with. Good. We, yes. We yes. <laughs> yeah. So what, how are we helping them? So women need access to capital. So lots of women have great ideas, and they can't get angel funded. Um, they can't get venture capital funding. Companies that go to scale have outside funding. Um, the vast majority of them do. And so finding, finding funding for women is, is essential. As a woman entrepreneur, just to comment on that, I've talked to VCs and angel investors who said, well, one of our prerequisite is a track record of having launched a venture before successfully. And I think that's actually a big hurdle for women because you don't have a lot of successful women. So you're kind of stuck. Whereas I have launched things in the past that don't kind of fit their profile that shows my capability, but I'm not part of that network of, oh, we know what you're capable of. And I think that's a huge obstacle for women. There, um, there's some bright lights. There are groups yeah. that are now starting. We're seeing more and more women who are investing um, early stage or even in the venture world. Um, it's something I'm personally very interested in trying to be helpful with. At one point in time, I was a mergers and acquisitions banker for J.P. Morgan in New York. Um, women don't show up in that world all that much either. Um, but those who do really want to help other women. And so I think that, you know, I'm also now 12 years out of business school. My business school so classmates. We're also going to talk about what you use on your face. Because what? you have done more <laughs> impressive things. And you look like you're 25. Oh, well, so thank we're, you. We're going to talk skincare later on. <laughs> oh, good. Go on. Um, I think that women who are in finance and who are, um, you know, 10, 15 years out of business school or younger are really interested in opening doors for other women. I think that there's a sea change that happened there. I think that women are, who are a little bit older than I am um, really had to battle it out to be in those jobs and, and open doors. And now I think that, um, you know, there's a sisterhood where, where women really do want to see other women in, mm -hmm. investors and see them succeed. How do we get more women? You said you want to get more women into business school. I do. So, I, I just want to say this is like amazing, and I hope you stay for a lot of questions. Yeah. We have to wrap because we have to turn the room because the press is coming. So we're gonna have to just. This is amazing because we could keep talking. It seems like for hours here. Yeah. So I just want to invite you to stay so that we Please, can all yeah. make sure we get whatever questions out there. Unless someone has one last burning question, but I think we're gonna have to. Wrap up. Who's burning? Good, then burn over there with drinks. Right. Uh, <laughs> the paperback is coming out when? 
paperback book is coming out in March. It's called The Creator's Code, and um, yes, I hope that it, I genuinely hope that it helps other people create and scale their ideas. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank what you. What a good note to end yeah. on. Thank you. Yeah.